Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, a podcast by Filecoin Foundation that explores the intersection of blockchain and the data economy. Today, we're joined by Prashant Maria to talk about Spheron's new compute marketplace, which features EVM compatibility, a decentralized matching engine, and customizability for both clients and GPU providers. Prashant, it's really great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me here, Arjun. Looking amazing, forward to amazing. have a wonderful discussion around it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and um, so to get started, I would love for you to just give like a quick introduction to yourself and Spheron and, and how, how Spheron has evolved to where you are now. And then um, I'd love to dive into some of the problems and the solutions that you guys are, are, are creating around uh, distri- distributed computing. Sure, man. Um, so I'll talk briefly about myself because I have a very long history. But just to cut it short, I started my journey in a call center to like learning everything from the scratch. And then coming, even though I was engineer, but I was an electronics engineer, so I never take it as a proud because I never learned coding there. So I had learned coding during my call center days. And then from there onward, I just learned, learned, learned. And then and that is where I started loving coding and falling in love into that. And then that is how my journey kind of started in this coding uh, verse, which we call. Nice. And, um, and now coming, speaking to now in Web3, um, even Web2. So combined together, I have spent close to a decade now. I still kind of like can't imagine like I spent a decade. <laughs> and I'm proud to say that. Um, so I spent around a decade understanding multiple systems, infrastructure. So my entire life, like I loved about infrastructure it- itself. Um, like modularity is something which I have been always been proud of because when I, when I joined Web2 also, then the wave of microservices and then you have PWAs and all of those things kind of started coming up. So that always brought my attention into this uh, ecosystem. In the Web3, I have spent close to around five years now. Again, completely into infrastructure. I have not done any DeFi, DEXs, anything like that. Just infrastructure, nothing more than that. That is what, where my domain expertise basically lies into. Um, coming to Spheron, again, Spheron is also an evolved product. It is not something which we always wanted to kind of build as a compute. Uh, we started from simple website hosting over an IPFS and Filecoin to where exactly it is today. So I would say like it, it was a pivot which we have done over the time. Now, I know term pivot is not being heavily used in Web3 and that is when where I all, you initially used to get uh, like avoid using the word pivot because generally people you start thinking like it's a failure, but in reality it's not. Uh, I as a founder always wanted to build something which people are going to love and use it. And to even find that point to kind of where founders can use it, you need to keep finding new ways of attracting people into your network. And that at one point of time, they will start loving it. And that is when you kind of get your PMF. And that is where Spheron is all about. So it's an evolution. Like it, it, is an, it is evolved from web hosting to the compute. And that is the reason like whenever we pitch Spheron, we pitch it with the confidence because we have seen infrastructure like literally from the like hardware <laughs> level. Uh, so from the from the top level of the stack, we went to the bottom level of stack. So that is where Spheron kinds of comes into. Now coming to what exactly we are building at Spheron now, like after all of this evaluation, we understood one thing. There is a requirement of GPU framework which is needed in, into this industry. Or you can say the GPU cloud framework which is needed into the, this industry. If you look at around yourself, we will find a lot of GPU coins launching day in and day out. The problem with all of them are they are very fragmented. Now, the moment, so fragmenting your liquidity is a very different thing, but fragmenting in hardware is a very different thing when it is already in, in scars. So what we are trying to achieve at Spheron is to combine them together via our marketplace model, which we already have. And this framework of Spheron allows it to quite seamlessly do it. Now, why we call it as a framework and not as something like, uh, marketplace. It is a marketplace which can be built using that, but it's a framework also because it allows you to have a right payment rail for yourself. It allows you to build your own cloud, let's say your own GPU cloud. It allows you to do things which you have never imagined to you can do it. Like, let's say you have to um, build an automation, you have to launch your own token, you want to do tons of other things, you can do it all around the Spheron utilizing the same framework and you don't have to make any changes. So that is where we are at Spheron, just changing and disrupting this entire industry with this model to ensure it's like the fragmentation around the GPUs can be removed and we combine these capacity together to achieve a wider goal to bring all of these GPU demand or CPU demands into the Web3 also from the Web2. So that is Great. where uh, the Spheron basically building now. 
So I feel like you guys do a really good job of kind of laying out an interesting problem statement, which is doesn't really, it's just, right. so you guys do a really good job of laying out a problem statement, which I feel like is an underappreciated problem in Web3, which is that, uh, well, centralized compute and storage providers like your Google Clouds and your AWSs aren't just the norm in Web2, they're actually taking over Web3 right now. And you have uh, entire dApps and blockchains that claim to be centralized that are hosting nodes on AWS instances, uh, which obviously is not very decentralized. And the whole point in, of Web3 is really to reduce the monopoly that these types of entities hold. Uh, so hoping you could discuss that problem in a bit more detail and, and why did you, why'd you guys set out to create a solution here? Yeah, sure. I don't know. I think you asked the question which everyone should ask in Web3 is, is why, why we should not use them and, and, and why you should basically opt for the services or the protocols like us who are kind of building into the space. So I'll, I'll pick this question in a very different way. Okay. Um, so imagine, in, and it, it is a question which everyone just should think about uh, into their companies and startups or protocols when they are kind of building. Imagine you are building everything like you are going on a stage, you are calling out, like we are building a Web3 world where everything is decentralized and all of those things. And these things are being heard and listened by the Web2 players who are sitting out there and then they're just laughing at you. And you know what, why they're laughing at you? is only because they know all of those things which you are building, you are building on top of us. So you claim whatever you want to claim. If we wish to go and shut down our servers today, you guys are already gone and out of the market, right? So, and that's, that's a very big question mark because Web3 is, is built to challenge the existing status quo as it is, right? Where the wealth has to get distributed. The, the control from centralized entities to go, should go to decentralized entities. So those are the core concepts and core pillars around the uh, Web3 itself, right? And all of those core pillars are already damaged because your fundamental layer, which is your hardware and your lower mid tail layer, everything is centralized, right? And that is where um, it kind of given us a pain at Spheron, like to us, to me, to my co-founder, to everyone who, who have been building along with the Spheron, is like how in the world it is logical to think like we are building something which is decentralized when everything is centralized on the bottom layer. Um, and that is that is what kind of given us a very big problem statement to kind of solve because as Web3 matures, we need more decentralized solution versus centralized one. And then now, um, on those parameters, there are a few things which we also have to understand is like, if we kind of go into the, the world of Web2, right? Um, imagine you're running a node, you're running a blockchain, you, everything is just sitting on a normal centralized AWS server. Then there is no point of that, like it is, and you cannot call itself as, as, a, as a decentralized network because as, as you just mentioned, like most of it, it is not. So that is what became a very deeper problem at Spheron and we wanted to kind of solve it at scale. Now the problem of solving that is you also have to understand why people like you, why people like me or people like anyone else who have been into the Web3 for a very long are using these centralized services. It's not like they want it. It's just like that they did not have any other option to do it, right? So if I ask you today, if I ask anyone, like you can after this, even whosoever is going to be listening to this entire podcast, they should retrospect this and they should just ask themselves how many Web3 companies you have seen giving you a product which is decentralized on the hardware or the software level, which allows you to run the nodes and anything. I can bet. I can bet on this, uh, not from one years down the line if you're watching this, but the day it is going to get launched, next six months till the time we are, we are kind of building a lot of other things. I can bet you will not find many applications where you can go and deploy your node servers, GPUs, or anything quite seamlessly with the same experience what, what Web2 has given so far into this world. So that it's it's not just the problem of, uh, I think, like what I personally believe, it's not the problem of the people who, who don't want to use uh, these things, but it's the problem of the fundamental problem of solving the uh, problem in Web3 itself. We try to solve the complex problem and make it more complex and this is our nature has been, is like we always used to get into, okay, let's solve this complex problem. But after solving that, we find like, okay, this is so complex that like normal people cannot use it. And that is what we are kind of set to solve at Sphere. It's like we want to make it so seamless, so smoother for everyone into the world who can basically go ahead and do that. I'll end up this entire thing with a small uh, example of it, how we kind of did it. 
uh, with a small example and we are trying we basically showed to the world how it can be done so um, today there are a lot of node as services which are which are there in the market like right? so um, tens of there now now like after this node mania like there are hundreds and thousands of like i don't know like i lost an account how many are there but if you go and check them none of them are using deep in network or deep in compute network to deploy those nodes the reason being because it's complex the reason being because it's tough to build and all of those things but what we did we launched a very small application it was it was just built in two weeks on top of spheron and we launched it it is called supernodes.com if somebody goes to supernodes.com you can log in and believe me it's a deep in product it uses a deep in underneath network which is spherons and then it uh, it deploys all these nodes on the uh, data centers which are connected with us right and that is how mm. and and the experience is so smooth like it is so buttery smooth i have like you can go to that community of supernodes you will find like people say this like i i have a lot of screenshots of people trying like bro like it's it's like very smooth experience of using like you just log in with your your google account you if you want if you have a google google account or anything account you log in then you click few buttons one button here one button there and then click on deploy and your node is up and running and those nodes are the blockchain nodes and they are not random nodes right so that is where we change that thought process like deep in can be used by masses to basically participate mm-hmm. in the network very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, it, this conversation reminds me of, uh, I think an interview I did with like Jeff Garzik, one of these Bitcoin OGs, like way back, you know, probably six, seven years ago or something, but he said something that, that struck out where he's like, well, if you want to take out the entire Ethereum network, if you just dropped like a, a like a, a huge bomb on Loudoun County, Virginia, where most of these AWS <laughs> data centers live, like you could basically <laughs> take down the entire Ethereum network. I was like, oh yeah, I guess that's not really not really definitely a central point of failure, you know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what it is today. I mean, that was that was a long time ago. So I don't know what how. It's, hopefully, it's more decentralized now, uh, spread out across different areas. But uh, but anyway, but but to your point, like. Uh, you also have this kind of crossing the chasm problem, right? Where if, if, if every innovator faces, where if you need, if you're trying to create something that is, you know, other that a new product people are going to use, it needs to be not just as good as the alternative, but like, uh, you know, an or, kind of an order of magnitude better for people to actually use it at any degree of scale, right? I think that's kind of the dilemma that that you were describing, where there's just not a whole lot of alternatives for people, uh, so they kind of have to use these. Web two services because there's just no other real alternatives available. But we're getting to the point now where I think there are some some you know w- w- some different deep end networks that are offering these services, and, and even with like Filecoin, for example, like we have uh, like like the like the chain archiving use case is one that's becoming interesting. Where Solana is there's there's an uh, you know the whole archive of the Solana blockchain is being stored on a Filecoin. Uh, storage provider right now, right? Which is which is an interesting use case where it's like, okay, like we're at the point where Web three can start providing Web three native services to other Web three uh, protocols or companies. Um, so with that said, um, let's kind of dive into what you guys are building here a bit more. And you know, from from what I kind of kind of gathered just from my research on on what you're building, I think what was really interesting was that you guys are building. It's not just like a marketplace for compute and GPU power. But there's a couple of really interesting innovations that you guys have where one is that you have sort of a decentralized matching engine where it's not there's not just like a single matching engine that could be like the point of failure or the bottleneck, but it's almost like a mesh, mesh network of, of matching engines almost if I can, it's probably not the correct way to describe it, but that kind of idea where it's like a decentralized, like the matching engine itself is kind of decentralized. Um, and you guys also have a, a bit more like kind of customizability baked into, um, you know, you know the, what the client can request and what the service or what the GPU providers can be providing. Uh, so hoping you can kind of walk us through exactly like what you guys have done and then how is this maybe unique compared to maybe some of the other like deep in GPU networks out there. Yeah, sure. I think um, as I mentioned, it's like so. Spheron has been uh, it's it's a product which built via multiple pivots. When I say that, I say it very proudly because we kind of learned from all of these existing protocols by building on top of them. And then we kind of found, okay, so there are these problems here, that problem is there, uh, but the user needs something else, uh, which is very disconnected from the real world, right? So most of these protocols. Um, so while we were building, um, 
like you you basically got most of the usp point you just spoke in matchmakers and all of those things but i'll try to get deeper into like why they are required uh, to kind of like scale and there are other use cases as well around spinon which is very quite unique as well um why matchmaker we kind of chose is like imagine you are you are going to buy uh, food in a restaurant and then what happens is like you just order the food as an individual as somebody who is ordering a food you should just get your food with the quality and the quantity what you ordered for you should not get into the kitchen and then start collaborating with the chef there and then start making the food there because this is not why you go to a restaurant or else you would be better in your house right you do it there um so that is something which matchmaker does for you is like you as an individual as a user you don't have to worry about anything else because it's a network complex like it is it is a because networks are always complex to kind of use so basically matchmaker removes that complexity for the end user so you ask matchmaker is like hey you know what match me somebody who is ready to provide this gpu or cpu configurations for this many duration of time and it does it for you right it's it's quite simple and straightforward the same matchmaker and the reason we always do open source way also at spheron like we have also have published this because you are able to read this is because we have published the white paper around it um it also gives everyone an edge and option to build a matchmaker this matchmaker can also be used to do anything in, in this network space right you can use it to build a tinder like application or you can use it to build something like let's say uh, matching the uh, person who wants to visit a hospital or matching the person who wants to visit something else for different regions for matching doctors together you can do it you can do magic around those that magic uh, that matchmaking engine so that's one part of it second part the reason i call like spheron as a framework is because it has a payment integration so for example i i was like when we were doing our um, dab journey on different protocols what we faced a bigger challenge is there are a lot of tokens which are not accepted into different countries and jurisdictions because they are not accepted so because they are not every they cannot be everywhere every jurisdiction works in a very different way for example usdc can be accepted in us while let's say some x coin which is which they claim to be an stable coin is not accepted in us so are you really going to leave the entire us market for this region no because you are going to be running the business all these gpu providers have trusted on you so that you can go and get those gpu sold in those market now you are not able to do it because of that random token reasons right um and that is where spheron shines spheron allows anyone both gpu provider and the user to go ahead and choose the payment they wish to accept and the go ahead and choose and and choose the payment which they wish to pay for example i want to pay in usdc so matchmaker basically matches you to the provider who is ready to accept usdc let's say i want to pay in spheron token now there's a match matchmaker basically take care of ensuring like you get connected to the person who is ready to accept spheron token now what it enables at a very fundamental layer is you literally can go and build you don't even have to now build any more supply like you bring your compute attach it on the other side you accept whatever token you wish to basically you can as a provider you can build your own economy around yourself which which is not at all possible today like as a provider like you are just dependent on the person who is running the entire market is right versus in our case it's very opposite as a provider you can you can go deeply into into that so that is the other other uh you call your what's the the profile what's the profile of a of your maybe a typical provider or like your maybe ideal provider is this is this somebody who's like kind of a lone wolf just like running stuff out of their hardware out of their home or is this like a data center like a fully kind of commercialized operation or is it somewhere like in the middle like wh- like what type of providers can can participate so here? in the provider also we have basically anyone can participate but not everyone will be able to promote it to the next tier into the spheron ecosystem so uh, what we have basically built around the spheron is like we don't restrict you like as i said web3 should be more open for everyone and and more inclusive in those nature so that is the reason like we never went ahead we don't want to like, just only work with data centers we do work with data centers but again they all have to walk their way up into the ladder to become the trusted partner into the ecosystem so that you your chance of getting match made is become higher and higher and people are ready to pay you the premium so even let's say Aaron you want to become a network provider you can do that what if you already have a system and you want to dedicate that to the system to the sphere on shall i not include you yes i can but the limitation is like you should have certain configuration which has to be there 
um, if you are meeting those configuration, then you can be. And it can be like you can create a small uh, room into your house where you can just put those racks or systems together and kind of make it work. It works. So, so we don't restrict that as such. But we have a tiering system, which basically takes care of these restrictions. Uh, it ensures is like only tier, only like, for example, in tier seven, the moment you reach to tier seven means like you have a high trust score, high availability, high all of those things. And then I, as an end user, I, I can go and choose that. Now, everyone who is in tier six, they will fight to come into tier seven. The, the same goes to the previous tiers as well. So that is how we have designed the entire tiering system so that the system, the entire marketplace runs smoothly where every good provider is well incentivized and every bad provider is removed from the network by putting all of these uh, proof of work, proof of capacity and all of those concepts into the place. So yeah, that is how it is designed. Got it, got it. And then as far as like clients, um, let's just take that same question and, 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 and reframe it from the client perspective. Like who are the types of, at least in the early days as you're starting off here, like who are the types of clients that you that would be like a good fit to be using this particular network? Like what's that prof what does that profile look like? So um, at Spheron, as I said, like so our current focus, like when we launched the CPU, our client was very straightforward. Like we wanted to target the blockchain like foundations and protocols and everyone like who were looking forward to run a lease out of the compute capacity. So those were our, our early customers and our early clients. Um, as we are moving to GPUs, our GPU segment is quite clear and we want to be very specific on those areas. We want to just focus on um, use cases around inferencing and we, we just don't want to get into training at this point of time, but we will be into the inferencing and fine tuning because uh, what I believe personally, it is, it's, it's my personal belief, um, there are a lot of companies who are selling decentralized training and everything. I don't know how they are able to achieve it, but uh, what I believe in is like training requires a lot of bandwidth consumptions and and a lot of lot of data transmission happens, and that should happen over a closed network, uh, which is very in a very close close proximity. So our our main use cases are going to be like fine tuning and the inferencing in that region. You have AI agents, you have LLMs, um, like people who are building that. You have tons of other use cases like that, which are around the around around these, which doesn't requires like heavy training but they require GPUs to process these requests much more faster. So those are the um, key areas where we are kind of like targeting and, and the startups like who are building specifically in, in Web3. So next six months, just Web3 startup. And we want to ensure is like most of the Web3 startups who are currently working or launching their own protocol, they are getting or they are, we are giving them compute from our side. So, and that is how we are kind of building all the applications around so that it can easily get plugged into their system as well. Got it. Got it. That's very cool. Very cool. Um, another part of your stack that I thought was super interesting is that you guys are basically leveraging like the Arbitrum uh, stack, like the like the Arbitrum L2, Ethereum L2, and you're using uh, basically using you know basically you've created this whole network as like an EVM compatible you know compute marketplace. And I'm just wondering if you could talk through like why is that significant? Uh, why did you guys make that that design decision? And like what benefits does that afford? Uh, like the Spheron marketplace, uh, perhaps vis-a-vis -vis if, 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 if it wasn't Ethereum, you know, t tethered to Ethereum like this? So, um, the, okay, so if, if we agree together, there are only few ecosystems which innovates every day. And one of the ecosystem is Ethereum. And I am personally aligned towards Ethereum because my entire journey started on Ethereum. So I can't like go... Uh, beyond Ethereum and do the things, and which I also love. I think the entire Filecoin ecosystem also loves Ethereum, and, and that is where uh, Filecoin teams are also building. So we all love Ethereum in in that sense, right? So that is one of the thing which kind of led us to kind of do that. And the other thing is like, let's say if even if for a reason, like for such just for a use case, I'm just taking it as example here. If you would have chose to kind of go to L1, and that is how we basically uh, reasoning like do the reasoning in, in Spheron. What we do is like we we basically choose ourselves to be there and then we kind of see ourselves. So let's say if even if we choose to kind of go, let's say launch our own layer one. The problem with all of this is like we have to do a lot of work <laughs> to make that happen. And we need a lot of capital to kind of innovate, right? Um, while in Ethereum, you are getting all of these innovations out of the box. Imagine like your smart accounts are there. You have account abstraction, which is getting built in. You have bridges, which are already existing, connecting different ecosystems. You have liquidity across the system. 
now ethereum is heavily like most of the things which are in ethereum they are been regulated in different different countries they have been accepted as well so that basically was one of the reasons to kind of be like on ethereum as well um and the other thing is like we are we are very solidarity oriented i think that also plays a very vital role when you decide we we don't we, didn't, we did not had rust team member in our team and i did not learn trust so even you know, none of my team members i think that was also one of the uh, key part of yeah not, not a whole lot of choices <laughs> and that's it, yeah. <laughs> so that is one of the key makes it easier yeah makes it easier and and kind of do that and the arbitrum and the layer 2s we have not like as i as i mentioned like so our focus has always been to more towards open source open driven and all of those things and i think like arbitrum kind of fall into that category uh to kind of do that so that is one of the reason like we chose arbitrum and then other options were also the gas fees and tons of other thing right because ultimately we have to do gas optimization tons of other thing and you have to look into is like if you are building ethereum again gas becomes because something which we all have to talk about um so we did all of those things and we found like arbitrum has the cheapest cost at point of time and we decided to kind of go ahead um to kind of like choose arbitrum l2 as an as an as an option but during our first launch it is not going to be on l2 it is just going to be a dap on mm. our arbitrum and then from there it will migrate to l2 so that is what our position is going to be oh very cool very cool uh no that's super interesting that's super and that, i find that pretty interesting because like you have in the, in the just in the the you know the deep in compute world right like or the decentralized gpu kind of world you have Akash, which is obviously like a Cosmos based product render. I'm not actually sure what like render is or some of these other things are, but like, but I feel like tying it to Ethereum, having the, you know, eventually with the roadmap of, of eventually becoming an Ethereum L2 really and like having that firm connection to the Ethereum, uh, not just like the community, but also just the technical stack, uh, seems like a pretty good design joy choice, uh, just given kind of the trajectory and like, where, like you said earlier, like a lot of like the innovation is just like. Ethereum just where the innovation is right now. That's just been where where things keep. There's always just new things popping up. So, um, wanted to just close out with uh, maybe kind of a final bigger picker bigger picture question here about, um, you know, I feel like these decentralized GPU networks have been. It's like it seems like the area of of deep in and of of, of crypto that I feel like it actually like makes a lot of real world sense. We're like wow, I feel like this this is actually a use case that, like. Like I understand, like you can explain to somebody who's not in crypto, like why you might need something like this. People kind of see the rise of AI and machine learning. Uh, obviously, like there's a, a glut of GPUs, and okay, like what do we, you know, how do we, how do folks acquire these things? How do folks acquire the computing power? Um, and how, how can we kind of utilize under, you know, underutilized resources to help provide this computing power? It's just it's a use case that just kind of makes sense intuitively, I think. Um, but at the same time, I think you know you know, deep in is like, this stuff is like really hard, right? <laughs> to actually execute, right? Uh, it sounds great, but the, like these types of things are actually really hard to execute it, it kind of in real life, right? Um, I'm just kind of thinking like, you know, maybe like long, like bigger picture, longer term here. Like what is it going to take for these types of networks to like actually gain, you know, like really kind of like massive adoption to the point where they are like, you know, maybe perhaps like serious competitors to something like an AWS or a, uh, one of these centralized providers. I mean, it's easy to see a world where they might become like kind of a niche, uh, like a neat, like a, you know, maybe like a niche service provider or like servicing a niche market. But is it, I mean, is it, is it feasible that these things could actually like really compete with these kind of these big monopolies? Uh, totally depends on how time, how much time frame you are kind of considering in an account. But if you ask me today, um, can you compete with all of these folks? I would say yes. Because that is where we envision everything, and that is the reason we are building what we are building. Now, the other interesting question which you have asked is like, all of these guys, like how that mass adoption will basically kick in? It's just a UX. What I feel because ninety percent, ninety five percent times, it's just a UX. When you switch any application from one to two, imagine if you are using one recording service today. And that has a lot of issues in connecting your network or let's say it is it has issues around hey you know what you have to install hundreds of different softwares to kind of achieve that you're not going to do it it's quite simple right so i first kind of look at it as a ux and if ux has been solved then other thing is going to be innovation so for example i have very great ux like amazing onboarding experience and tons of other things but when i go and deploy my computer or laser compute 
it takes two hours to do it, right? So, um, so that's also not like uh, that. Also, should not happen. So, there should be an innovation around networking layer. There should be an innovation around um, how these GPUs are getting optimized over network. There should be an innovation around how effectively we, effectively you can create a clusters and regional clouds and tons of other things. So, if all of those things can be achieved, like I think it is, and that is where most of our um, competitors and even the Spheron is working towards to kind of achieve that at scale, we all will be into the world where we either we are going to force AWS to dilute themselves and convert themselves as a DAO, or they, or people will start shifting to uh, decentralized web applications. Great, great. Um, well, anyway, well, Prashant, really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, I'll turn it back to you for any like quick, quick final thoughts, and then how can folks find you and get in touch if they want to learn more? Yeah, I think uh, we have published already 250 plus blogs so far, so you can always type Sphere on Google, and we have did a very good job in in getting ourselves ranked there. Um, you will find us there. Um, all the details are on our website, but if you want to, like, if you love the entire conversation, if you love our thought process, how we think about. Do give us a shout out on Twitter and all of these places. Our handles are quite, again, easy to find. Spheron FDN, which is foundation, is, is our uh, Twitter official channel. My official channel is Prashant underscore XYZ. So you can search that and you should be able to find us. And most of this information is already on our uh, website. So you don't have to go anywhere. Just log into our website and you'll find all the details there. And the website is spheron.network. And it is going to be that. Amazing. Well, Prashant, appreciate your time. And uh, thanks everyone for watching and we will see you next time. Thank you, Aaron.